taking the time to come. We really appreciate the time uh, all of you have taken either to join us uh, remotely or to come all the way to Japan for this meeting. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I will ask now if there are any declarations of conflict uh, for the morning meeting. Uh, seeing none, I think we're ready to move on. Uh, the next item would normally be the welcome for new chapters in SIGS. As it turns out, we don't have any new chapters this time around, um, but the chapters do continue to make progress. We had 14 different chapter communities uh, refresh their leadership during the, the last period, including the local chapter here in Japan. Uh, so uh, we look forward to continuing to work with the ongoing chapter leadership and to work with the new chapter leadership. Uh, that's recently been seated. Uh, our first speaker today will be Glenn Dean, representing the IETF Trust. Uh, Glenn. Thanks, Ted. <clears throat> this is on? Thanks, Ted. Uh, do we have slides? So I uh, am the chair of the IETF Trust. Uh, I decided to stick around next year to talk to you guys because I missed, I think, the last two meetings. I missed the, uh, the one Victor filled in for me. Um, after London, and I think I was missed the previous one because I was sick with COVID right after the ITF. So um, I thought it'd be good to drop by and say hello. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are five trustees. Uh, they have continued to be uh, these five trustees since uh, you last, the last appointee was Victor from uh, yourselves appointed. Uh, Stefan Wenger was just reappointed by the ITF ISG, and I myself was just reappointed by the ITF NOMCOM. We went through the process we do every March and selected our officers. Uh, I continue to be chair and Kathleen has uh, volunteered and been selected to continue as treasurer for another year. But those are our five trustees, uh, Glenn Dean, Kathleen Moriarty, Joel Halpern, Stefan Winger, and uh, Victor Carissa. Did I get the, did I do the last name right properly? I've been practicing. I've been trying to get better. Okay, next slide, please. So for those who don't know what the ITF Trust is, and that's been completely fair because we tend to be pretty quiet, uh, we hold the IP uh, for the ITF and for other groups such as IANA and ICANN. Uh, and so we protect those IP assets. We are not lawyers, but we pay lawyers some good money uh, to help us and give us advice. But our job is to essentially manage these assets and protect them so they can continue can, can be continued to be used by the ITF community uh, and beyond uh, without anybody else taking control of them and restricting their use. Next slide, please. So since uh, Victor at last updated you after uh, the ITF in London, uh, we've been busy. We've uh, renewed a couple uh, trademarks. Uh, we renewed the uh, IANA trademark in the United States. In fact, I just got an email from the lawyers this morning saying that that had been successfully accepted uh, by the U.S. Trademark Office. So that one is officially done. Uh, we have also renewed the ITF trademark in Canada. And uh, so we have a, a series of these trademarks that come up periodically around the world for renewal. And if anybody's paying attention, there is a trademark in New Zealand for the ITF that we have been trying now for uh, pretty much about two years to get properly updated. And it has been a, a real interesting battle going, uh, collecting signatures and getting them recognized and processed by the New Zealand Trademark Office. It's protected, it's registered. There's no problem there. We're just trying to make sure that we get the proper list of owners updated. And uh, that's in process. And I'm really hoping this is the last set of information we have to send them before they finally do the update. So if you've been paying attention to that, it's been a, been a fun journey. Uh, in addition, we have uh, updated our 2023 budget, approved it, and published it. It's available on our website. If you care to go to the IHS tr trustee website, it's right there. And I'll give you a, a glimpse of it in a minute. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the restructuring. Uh, we are undergoing from a, uh, uh, a Virginia trust to a Delaware corporation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide, please. So this is our budget for 2022, 23, and the advice for 2024. Uh, what you're going to notice is that there's a real bump in the overall amount uh, for between 2022 and 2023. Two things are going on uh, in that budget. The first one is we're building a two-year reserve. Uh, the trust has historically and continues to operate with a very small budget compared to other organizations, especially when you consider the legal work we do. We have a very tiny budget. Uh, but we've decided to increase the background reserve that we hold uh, up to a two-year mark so that in case anything uh, goes bump in the night and we need to dip into that reserve, we have some funds immediately available. 
So that was responsible for part of the bump. And the other part of the bump is that we are restructuring from a, uh, a trust to a corporation. And that of course takes lawyers. And so we've spent some money on lawyers and other conversion exercises uh, to make sure we get that done right. And that once done, it doesn't have to be revisited for many years to come. Any questions on the budget while I'm here? This is where people usually have a question. Okay, moving on, next slide, please. Finally, uh, the restructuring update. So this is a project we started off um, uh, about a year and a half ago. And we've, I've come and talked to the, the ISOC Board of Trustees uh, during the consultation we did with the community. Uh, we also held webinars. We did a lot of conversations with the broad community. Uh, and in general, we, we were very strongly supported in what we were gonna do. The reason we're doing this restructuring is that uh, you know, when they set up the, the ITF trust uh, back in 2005, the trust structure made sense back then. But over time, uh, especially in the United States, trusts have been used uh, by some very clever lawyers to do things like generational wealth skip skipping and other things which attract a lot of legal attention in fighting among families. Uh, one of the results of that is that getting insurance for trustees is very difficult and the trustees have been unable to increase the amount of insurance covered carried by the trust uh, for the last several years we believe we are currently underinsured and that there is a considerable liability being held personally by each of the trustees the solution for this one of them is to convert to a corporation which has different liability rules around its officers and will protect the trustees better while allowing the mission of the trust to continue without change and so that's what we're undergoing right now next slide please instead uh, just a quick question. Uh, during the uh, the consultation that was done for this, uh, obviously, in addition to the ITF IPR, you're, you're holding the IANA marks. Um, was the ICANN community reaction to this essentially positive, neutral? Um, what was the... Uh, so the actual community we serve for the IANA marks is the NROs, and we did reach out to the NROs and discuss with them, and we received positive feedback from all of them. That's who we have the contract with, is the actual NROs, is, is the actual contract for doing that work. So um, as I recall, the, the trust holds the marks for like the domain IANA.org, right? Correct. Um, and so in general, the community that's involved is the, is the broader community that, that shares access to, to the IANA. Um, so in, in, the, <clears throat> in the past, at least, there was a, a convened group of advisors to the trust, um, the name of which is escaping me, but I think you just missed it. CCWR, well, yeah. Uh, so the, the consultation went to them as well? We then... broadcast out the consultation. Uh, the consult consultation we did was independent of the ITF, so we didn't just do it at ITF meetings. We broadcast it out amongst all the community, as and a... uh, the people that came and gave us comments we listened to. I don't recall anybody from that specific group showing up and discussing with us. We did have representatives from the NRO organizations show up and make comments. Um, but uh, we did not hear anything direct, positive or negative from that other community. Okay, but so we did broadcast pretty broad and wide. We 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 over we made an attempt to over broadcast so that we did get out. Okay, so it essentially was neutral. That, that's fine. thank you. So uh, and, and because there's a lot of concern about this, we've been taking it very slowly to get it right. Uh, and one of the things I want to point out is that the new bylaws for the new corporation are drafted against the original bylaws that the ITF trust has been operating with. And we, while it's very tempting when you do something like this to go in and say, well, I know there's been problems maybe someplace that I didn't like, uh, and I'm gonna take this opportunity when we have the, you know, the cover off the bylaws to make some changes. We held ourselves to a higher standard than that and said, no, we are gonna do a conversion from what we have today, which, which, which is working, to a new set of bylaws which reflect those same things but in the right terms for corporations, uh, but without making any amendments or changes or trying to improve things. So it's a one for one conversion we've done. Uh, and we've kept it very simple and that we hope reflects the, uh, the intention of the trust and the intention of the community. Uh, since again, the trust is working and nobody has come to us and said there's a problem with how the trust operates. That, that has not occurred prior to the consultation or after, so. One to one, we've maintained parity. So where we're at right now, we have created the new corporation in Delaware. It exists, it was created uh, at the end of last year. Uh, there are no assets transferred over to it as yet. We are going through the process right now in the United States 
of getting its 501c3 not-for-profit status recognized so that it has the same status as the current ITF trust does and its paperwork and waiting for the IRS to respond. When that is done, we are then going to go back to the asset pool we have and work with the lawyers to make sure those assets are properly transferred over to the new trust uh, corporation and the new corporation name uh, that we applied originally to call it the ITF Trust Corporation. And originally Delaware said, that's fine. You've been using it for many years. That's fine, you can do it. When we actually did the registration of the new corporation and filed the bylaws, they said, well, you can't call a corporation a trust. That's far too confusing. You have to have a new name. So we, we came up with the lovely name, the ITF, Intellectual Property Management Corporation. And if you're a bit of a, a tech nerd, you will recognize that it is the ITF IP Management Corporation as short. So <laughs> there's, there's a bit of an Easter egg in the name. Anyhow, uh, so that's where we're at right now. We're waiting for the uh, IRS termination. And when that happens, we will begin the exercise. You can see we're going to update the RFC BCPs to reflect the, the names and the, and the proper changeover. We're going to then do the IPR uh, work for the moving the ITF contributions over to the new entity. The RFC copyrights on the existing RFCs will be moved over, along with the trademarks for ITF, IANA, and others that we hold. Uh, the software licenses, code donations, and Yang catalog will also be transferred over the new entity. And then finally, we'll make a sweep through all of the other IPR assets and duties that the trust performs for the, uh, the, the community and move those over as well. So that the, hopefully by the end of 2023, the work of the current trust will be moved over to the new entity and the old entity, the old trust can be decommissioned and shut down. And as for the leadership, the leadership just transfers over directly. Uh, the bodies that appoint still appoint. So ISOC will be appointing one of the directors for the new corporation. It's Victor currently. Uh, the ITF Noncom will appoint three directors, uh, which they already have. And the uh, IESG will appoint one of the directors. So essentially what is today is what transfers over tomorrow. Their name is gonna change from trustee to director. So uh, I believe you and I chatted a little bit about changing the timing of that so that the appointments were made at similar times. Maybe you want to update the group. Well, I, well you and I did chat about that because in the, historically there's been a, uh, this group appoints your appointee to the trust at a slightly different schedule. Normally it's done at the beginning of each calendar year by the ITF, year a little bit later. And since we hold officer elections and we were in the past, we had to also do transfers of uh, trademarks because a, a peculiarity in some laws in some jurisdictions is that trust can't hold trademarks so in many places you'll find that the individual trustees are the ones registered as the owners of the various trademarks and so whenever we got a new trustee we had to go back and spend the time and the money with lawyers to file uh, trademark ownership updates across the globe for all these assets uh, one of the things that actually is a big benefit of the corporation is that corporations in fact can own the trademarks, we won't have to do that in the future. And so the need to synchronize, I think has actually gone down, it's gonna get better with this. And, and so I'm gonna step back and say, let's not worry about that anymore. I think it's all, we're all good and, and able to proceed as, as the status quo. And that's my presentation. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, about the corporation, about the budget, about what the trust does? Uh, anybody wanna talk about IPR? idiosyncrasies. Uh, I, I will share one fun thing, one fun fact. I think history was made here at the ITF this week. I appeared yesterday at a technical working group, not a process working group, not a, not any you know structural stuff. I appeared at a technical working group to talk about a technical change uh, that the trust had wanted in an RFC. And I think that may be the first time the trust ever spoke and made a technical request of, a, of an ITF working group. So history was made. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it went really well. They were very supportive. What what could that have been? I, I've been kind of racking my, my brain here as you've been telling it the story. It turns out that there was uh, a Yang module template that had been created and that had been desired to be used by people creating Yang modules. And the way they had done the template didn't meet the ITF uh, licensing provisions uh, rules for how you mark that properly. So we had to go back to them and say, your template can't be reused by people outside. And we've had a request from the IEEE to do a publication involving this. And so either we have to write them a specialized license, which we don't like to do ever, uh, or we need to actually correct how you've published your template. Okay, so it was not a technical 
change. This was. Oh, give me that. G g give me the history. Okay, Just, give, give me that small bit you. of uh, small you. achievement. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I, I think if we were having the trust recommend technical changes, I would be like, oh, really? <laughs> so, yeah, that, I, that that sounds fine. And one of the things we're going to do as a follow-up is uh, create some education modules for the uh, ITF working groups so that they understand how to use the trust licensing provisions properly in the documentation they produce and publish so that they are licensable and usable under the framework we've established. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming and sharing the report and uh, wish you a... a... I'll be taking the fine gift. Yeah, All right, yeah. uh, to take any fine gift you like. Um, thank you again and uh, uh, successful rest of your time here in, in Japan. Wow. Uh, the next uh, report is from Cheryl Langdon Orr uh, from the steering committee of the chapter advisory uh, committee. Uh, Cheryl? Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the Board of Trustees for uh, offering us this opportunity on behalf of the uh, Chapter Advisory Committee, Steering Committee for a very brief and beginning of the year update. So I won't be taking too much of your time, of course. Um, we have provided you with a very brief nuts and bolts um, mini report, um, complete with a an updated spelling, or actually typo error, where I had left a 2023 date instead of a 2022 date, um, and that outlines our structure and our um, activities um, up until now, as well as also outlines the dates for the future um, full chapter uh, meetings that we which which we hold um, in this case four times um, in this coming year. We've recently held our first full chapter advisory committee uh, meeting earlier. Uh, I was going to say this month, but it's now last month uh, on the twenty first, twenty second on my time zone, um, and we were a little disappointed with um, only about um, 41, 42 of the chapter representatives out of a possible 99 um, being in attendance. So one of the things we're going to be undertaking is a proactive approach um, to reach out to um, all of those uh, representatives as named um, by those uh, chapters that have named them, of course, and unfortunately that's not all of the chapters either. Um, and just to remind them about the upcoming dates uh, for the rest of the year um, and the value proposition that they have by being actively involved in the chapter advisory council. Um, we as a as a steering committee, the nine person steering committee, um, and whilst we were voted in um, the end of November last year and confirmed at the beginning of December, we didn't start our functional work until January, in fact, mid January um, this calendar year. And on that very first meeting, which was a transition meeting from the previous steering committee, um, we had a three person leadership team appointed um, with myself um, acting as chair. Um, Adebimni um, from Nigeria as vice chair this year and Heba from Egypt um, continuing in the role of secretary um, for this year, forming that three-person team. What's important about what we're doing um, in this coming year is trying to open up more opportunities for discourse and interaction between the chapters via their representatives and ourselves as a steering committee. Whilst we meet monthly, and in fact, the leadership team of the steering committee meet twice monthly, um, one time with their staff to ensure that action items have been addressed, activities have been looked at, and the agendas are being set. Um, we've opened up a couple of um, box notes um, whereby any chapter representative uh, on the council can bring up at any time it becomes apparent to them that there's a topic, a matter of interest or a concern that needs to be addressed by us. And we're hoping that that will allow a more free flow of information between us all. Um, other than that, I guess I'm open for questions. Please, please. Hi, thank you. Is this working? Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. I I was very happy to be at the as an observer to the meeting, 
and the uh, I saw the interaction. I agree. I agree with you. The uh, lack of participation of the uh, of the chapters is uh, noticeable. So I think we should work more to bring people to contribute. Uh, I was very pleased to hear this question about the AMS, but I cannot see any responses in the in the box. So I don't know what happened there. But the uh, people complained, and they don't do not write down the complaints. So we are running in uh, darkness. Yes. So that's something that we really need to work in the communities. The other thing is this question you made about the threats about on the internet. Yes, which also I found a very interesting exercise, and I see more people participating, but what we may call the usual suspects, people that over participate. So I need to work in, uh, I think we we need people to get involved in ISOC. If we want ISOC to change, then we need people to get involved. Thank you very much. Couldn't agree with you more. And one of the things I'm hoping that we might be able to do um, as we become more proactive, um, which is our intention this year, is also work with the uh, regular regional meetings to um, restate some of the messaging um, and make some of that encouragement, perhaps switch from intention to action, which would be very good for all of us. Cheryl? Yeah, thanks. Uh, George here. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm going to ask you to speculate on a couple of things and add whatever knowledge you have. One, why isn't there more participation? Did you get any reaction from the non-participants or from the marginal participants about why this was useful or not useful? And second, what areas of substance do you think are, 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 are behind uh, the concerns of the chapter that you'd like to bring to our attention. Uh, this doesn't have to be 100% certain, but uh, can you speculate a little bit? Give us some guidance on uh, what to be aware of. Thank you. Certainly happy happy to do that, George. Uh, you know me, I'm always happy to do it with a speculation as long as you don't hold it against me if I'm wrong. Um, first of all, in terms of um, any sort of analysis, we haven't done the outreach yet. That is what we are about to do in this coming month. Um, and I'd be delighted to report back to you on that at a later date when we actually have some facts um, to talk about. Um, but one of the things that has become apparent um, is in the past, uh, we've had less opportunity for interaction actually taken up. Um, so there's been um, the intentions to run um, four interactions per year, and that has not necessarily been the case. So I think there's a degree of complacency that has occurred uh, amongst the representatives onto the chapter advisory council, um, and we need to break through that complacency and set expectations that there will be regular opportunities for interaction and activity. Um, so part of the solution there will be to build in some value propositions for the chapters. And one of our little projects, for example, in this coming year is the development with any of those interested parties from the chapters um, for a set of good or best practices for election procedures, something that we trust will be useful across the board, regardless of whether you're a very advanced, uh, democratically based chapter or one that's uh, struggling with um, the hows and the and the and the where tos um, for running a a good and valued um, electoral process. And so we're hoping that by actually giving some specific assistance that they see value in, we'll also see them have greater input into building more value for other chapters and other activities. In terms of the issues, um, we have a number of issues that are usually seen with relationship to things like how a chapter needs to be structured in terms of its um, ability to have, um, uh, for example, bank 
um, the nature and structure of its of its um, of its its corporate or non corporate identity, um, and fitting in um, with the ISOC guidelines. There's still some friction points there. Um, there is still some um, concerns, I suppose, um, about the existing membership system that we're working with, and there's a great deal of hope certainly on some chapters, um, fronts, um, that the transition to the new AMS system and a little bit more integration between the various platforms will solve some of those problems. Um, but other than that, um, I think what we are seeing is more input during the regularised, when they are regularised, regional meetings where if there is an open mic and less presentation, we may be able to hear and then start to act on some of these concerns rather than have them directly presented to us. Uh, Charles? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, well, uh, it's Charles. Uh, Cheryl, thank you for your leadership and your contribution at all, as always. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. First, uh, I do see a bit of confusion among some of the chapters about check and uh, the regional AP, uh, the regional, uh, whether it be Asia or Europe, you know, the bureaus, yep. and uh, right. and uh, even some of the functional calls of uh, that that are being organized from time to time by ISOC staff and so on. So chapters are sometimes very confused about which one is which. So my question is, how do you deal with that? And uh, and do you have your? I mean, for check, I mean, do you have your own ways of reaching out to all the chapters? Because on the, in one sense, or do you have to rely on staff and so on? But but obviously you do have to because because they keep changing, right? The leadership and and all that keep changing. <laughs> uh, the other question is, I do see that Jack has a very important role in bridging between the board and the chapters, right? That's probably among the main functions of the Jack. So how do you see? your checks relationship with the chapters being developed and also with the board. Uh, are there areas that you believe that needs to be improved, uh, particularly since this is the board meeting, you know, what do we have to do at the board level to be able to support the check better? And finally, uh, do you see any particular geographical region that in your work you seem to get more support of or less, less participation from? Uh, among all the different regions in the world, you know, Europe, Asia, uh, mm -hmm. Africa, and so on. Do you see some gaps in some of these re geographical regions, for example? Yeah, that, those are my questions. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that, Charles. I, if you don't mind, I might try and take those in reverse order. Yeah. Um, in terms of the um, diversity across the regional input, <clears throat> and and more perhaps not even the regional import that the um, least developed versus um, uh, more in inverted commas um, developed um, economies, um, we see a, a disparity. But I haven't seen all of the meetings for this year yet. So this is a looking back, not on our current. Uh, chapter advisory council um, steering committee work, but rather um, looking back on what has happened previously. Um, and in that, we see a good reaction and response um, in terms of presence and um, opportunity to share and raise concerns and bring forward opinion in coming out of Africa. Um, and far too much of the usual suspects coming out of Asia-Pac. Um, so we're not getting the, the full breadth that we could get out of, out of Asia-Pac, at least in my very biased view, being part of that one, of course. Um, again, very much the usual suspects out of uh, Europe and out of North America as well. Um, and I guess that needs to be looked at as a relationship with the staffing in each of those regions and the actual chapter advisory council representatives in each of those regions. For example, in the last year or two, we've had really excellent engagement um, out of Africa 
um, and what that's done has in fact helped and assisted more voice being heard from that region. Now that's a good thing. What we need to do is find ways of bringing all of those regions into more equity because after all we want diversity but we want balance in that diversity as, as well. So we don't want a, a disequity here. Um, some of that in my view um, can be done if we develop in this coming year and years coming after this one, um, a slightly closer working relationship between the uh, regional offices and the regional staffing um, activities. Um, there's often a disconnect between um, any sort of uh, chapter advisory council activities and our now I'm moving back to one of your earlier questions, um, to reach out to our members is by um, a directly um, by a email announce list that can be activated, obviously from staff, but certainly from um, our secretary or ourselves, um, and going directly to the named chapter advisory committee uh, council representative. So that really is our primary tool. Um, we probably could do far more in terms of reduction of confusion if we had more regularised recognition for purpose amongst what goes on in the regional um, interactions. There seems to be a good deal of duplication um, of, of information that goes out. Um, and certainly I've attended a number of regional meetings and um, not heard hide or hair of uh, the Chapter Advisory Council or what its purpose is. And as you certainly outlined, it is a very important purpose as a bridge between yourselves and the chapters. Did I miss anything, Charles? Mohammed, you had a follow-up question? <clears throat> Yes, thank you, Cheryl, for uh, these comments and this information. Uh, firstly, I have a comment and then question. So I would be uh, really interested, as you just mentioned, that you are uh, the steering committee is starting its term, and it would be interesting to see the uh, the strategy that you adopt to deal with the challenges that the steering uh, uh, CHAC faces. The question is that you mentioned there are about 99 chapter representatives. So I believe there are about 120 or so chapters. Right. Uh, are there any strategies in work to uh, motivate those chapters to send their representatives or nominate someone to uh, participate in CHAC? What you are doing well, about that? Certainly. Well, one of the things, of course, uh, that the, mo the motivation, the highest degree of motivation for chapters to um, to ensure that they have a named uh, representative to the chapters advisory council is, of course, uh, that it contributes to their um, um, uh, half yearly and yearly um, review. Um, and so, you know, one one does better um, in one's chapter review um, if one has dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. Um, but that's clearly not working for 21% of our chapters. It is, I think, on the 20th, uh, which was the last count, but it was 122 chapters. So you're, you're spot on in your numbers there. Um, and, you know, 21% is far too high a percentage. Um, now, obviously, if some of those chapters are entering into various stages of, of rejuvenation, um, that's part of the solution. But during that rejuvenation process with staff, the expectation will be um, that they will be um, naming a representative to the Chapter Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. But what we've also got here is a, a, a period of time between the when the chapter advisory council was formed and the very good rationale for its formation and now and the activities that went on in its early days and therefore the buy-in and interest that the chapters had in all of that activity and after a little bit of a lull period the potential for even new chapter advisory uh, council representatives to not actually understand what the purpose is. And so an education program, an outreach program, a mechanism in our case we're going to select for 
individual literally emailing to the individuals named and getting those that are listed to engage as best they can or suggest replacement for themselves if they're no longer able to take on the role. Um, and then in the second half of the year, look at trying to shift that 21% to a lower percentage of non-named representatives um, and linked to each chapter. Are there any other comments? Okay, well, I, we really appreciate your joining us today and uh, both for the formal report and for the conversation afterwards. Thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time for taking good a good interest in what I think is really important work that we're hopefully going to be doing together. Thank you and bye for now. Uh, so the... Just as a reminder to the, the board, there are a couple of uh, reports that we received as written only, and there are a couple of elements of those that we probably want to pull out. Uh, from the OMAC, for example, uh, the conclusion of the, re the, the report is actually advice directly to the board. Uh, it's, it's fairly short, so I'm just gonna read it. Um, Everyone has a role to play in the internet survival. The OMAC acknowledges that the internet society is committed to working with its organization members so that the internet can remain a resource for everyone. With this in mind, the OMAC would advise the Internet Society to engage more members in its outreach and advocacy efforts to build collaborative support in defending the internet. Organization members are always interested in receiving insights on internet policy and regulations that will enable them to make informed decisions for their organizations. Therefore, the Internet Society's timely reactions to internet policy proposal and delivery of impact briefs continue to be well received by organization members. And finally, lastly, the OMAC suggests that the Internet Society enhances its communications around its project impacts to the public to maximize everyone's understanding and involvement in support of the advancement of the internet. So that, that was direct advice to the board from OMAC. Um, for the IATF LLC, I'd like to draw your attention to um, the fiscal year operating budget on slide six. Um, rem a reminder that this is for uh, fiscal year 2022, not the current year. Um, but as you can see, it was quite seriously uh, in the red. Uh, although they, they, they used yellow about half the time, it's really in the red. Um, there was a significant drop in online uh, and on-site meeting registrations during that year. Um, and of course, also a significant drop in uh, investment. So the, the year-to-date variance was quite significant. Um, we are already seeing some recovery there. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the numbers for uh, ITF-116 here were 1,000 on-site and 600 remote. So that's really bringing it back closer to what it was prior. Uh, so we are expecting uh, some recovery there, both on the investment side and, and on this. Um, but but that is something that uh, this board ought to know. Uh, George, you have Yeah, Ted, remind me, is the uh, calendar year the fiscal year for IETF? Yes. So these are final, subject to audit, these are final numbers. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the, this, as as Andrew notes, is, is actually part of our budget as well. So we need to, to take take into account uh, when these occur. Uh, they have a separate reserve and I believe they drew on that separate reserve, but it is something for us to keep, keep in mind. Uh, from the IAB uh, written report, I wanna draw your attention to a couple of the statements. Uh, they, uh, the IAB submitted comments to the FTC on the trade regulation rule on commercial surveillance and data security. It also uh, responded to the call for input from the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on the relationship between human rights and technical standard setting processes for new and emerging digital technologies. Uh, in general, uh, the, the IAB is, is working on a number of issues that uh, other parts of ISOC are also working on. Um, if you look at the workshops and workshop reports, the environment impact of internet applications and systems was a workshop they held. Uh, recently, and I believe that sustainability is a, a general question which has been raised by many parts of the organization. Um, we had discussed in previous meetings possibly having uh, a joint meeting with the 
Internet Architecture Board. Uh, we weren't able to arrange that for this meeting uh, just because we came to the conclusion that it was it was needed after many of the IED had already made their travel plans. Uh, however, I've chatted with uh, Miri Kuldund, who's the IED chair, uh, and they would be more than happy to arrange that for the, the next time we meet together, which will be in Prague. Uh, so they're very, very much willing to sit down and have a discussion about how some of the technical views they hold on these matters relates to the broader views of other parts of ISOC. Um, it's just a, something that we need to arrange as we get a little bit closer to the time. Uh, are there any other questions or comments on the written reports we received? Uh, Victor? Oh, it's his work? Oh, sorry. Turn it on. Um, one of the things I did not ask Jace, Jason, the LLC, this time around when, um, is one of the things we noticed. And it is what it is. COVID was a hard time to judge how many on-site attendees would have. They would have how many would be remote, and we know there's a delta in terms of revenue from from those. Is um, I just wanted to make sure they weren't using potentially the uh, Yokohama as a metric for what might be the next two meetings. For I didn't get a chance to tell them. I'm not sure what the the body's thoughts are because one is, is we seem to have a lot of local attendees that came which seemed to be out of the norm from what I gather, but, and which was good. It was great to see a lot of local attendees. I just don't know if we're gonna see that same uptick potentially in the, in the, in the next two venues, given that it's Prague and, and San Francisco. So just not speaking for Jason, but historically the ones held in Silicon Valley or near it have actually had a lot of local at attendance um, because it's trivial for people to get uh, the the travel budget to to drive up the 101 right so um it's a it's a it's unclear to me whether we'll actually see even a greater effect of that in san francisco uh before kind of returning to normal in prague where i think the that effect is somewhat lower uh barry yeah i guess this is barry lee but it does uh, pretty much the same thing japan and san francisco seem to be the two big ones for huge amounts of local people who only come to those meetings so, yeah. um, the other problem that they're facing isn't so much the um, the issue around how many people are coming in person. It's the increased costs. Um, it's very difficult now to get the kind of insurance we had in the past uh, that actually protected the IETF uh, during the pandemic. Though those contracts are are simply not available, and the 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 kinds of contracts that are being offered have much higher costs, both for the rooms and for some of the um, ancillary activities. So we, we are basically looking with the rest of the industry that does conferences or workshops at uh, a new baseline for what it costs to put these things on. Um, and uh, the ITF is gonna have to, to look at that. They've actually floated a, a proposal already uh, for increasing the registration costs uh, that's meant in part to, to offset this. Um, but uh, the other thing is that they're finding that more and more people aren't using the room blocks that have been set aside, but going for lower cost hotel, which are near to the venue because their own travel, each individual um, or the travel department of their companies uh, is requiring them um, to use the, the lowest cost available. And, and that means that room block guarantees and other things that we've historically used to lower the costs of the registration fees are, are not necessarily working anymore. And I'll add that uh, Jay has told me that often the hotels aren't even negotiating room blocks anymore. We have no room block here. That's, you know, we got a rate, but it wasn't a particularly good rate and there's no requirement for the room block. Yeah. Any other questions on any of the written reports we've received? Okay, uh, the next person is the uh, Japan chapter report. Um, so, um, Kobayashi Sama, please uh, take, a, take a seat and we'll be happy to hear your report. Okay, I think where's yours? Uh, Yeah. 
got your slides for you. Thank you. Oh, okay, <laughs> it works. So, um, as good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very honored to be here uh, in the in the board meeting of ISOC Japan I, I, in, I, ISOC, and I'm a vice chair from ISOC Japan chapter. And uh, today, I would like to introduce what kind of activities happen inside of our chapter. So, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. So, our next slide, please. So, I am Mar Mariko Kobayashi. Uh, I am vice chair of ISOC Japan chapter, and also a board member of Y project, which is a supporter sponsoring of ITF 116 uh, this year. And currently, I work for private sector. Uh, if you know, uh, there is a company, uh, Mercari. Uh, we provide a C2C selling app for the, the like this is for the for consumer service. And I work for the research and development team in that company. And I joined ISOC Japan chapter when I was an undergrad student. <laughs> so it was several years ago. <laughs> and uh, um, but I am very happy to continue to involve in the internet related communities activity. And I love uh, 70s and 90s music and uh, playing board game. <laughs> so that's why sometimes the over 60 years people will be my good friend. <laughs> so if you're interested in the, <laughs> the kind of the generation's music, uh, please talk to me. <laughs> so next slide, please. So I'm not for sure how many people know about this fact, but uh, in fact, Isaac Japan chapter is the I think first local chapter, right? Uh, it was launched in 1994. Uh, actually, I was born in that exact year. <laughs> in August 1994 was my, my birthday. So please remember. <laughs> and uh, so this is the certificate of the, 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 I think certificate of the chapter at the moment. So next slide, please. Uh, sorry, yeah, I think you would like to take a picture. <laughs> You want to check if you have it. Ah, got it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. And so ISOC Japan chapter was established in August 1994, which is my birthday. <laughs> uh, one of the first chapter, local chapter, I think, I think when ISOC introduced chapter system. And uh, I think in the last year, or I think in the past several years, we had a gigabit chapter, uh, thanks to uh, the, the everybody and uh, Japanese local communities. And currently, the number of ISOC Japan chapter members who, who is a 465. And uh, that also a Japan, uh, Japan Network Information Center provide a secretariat function uh, with us. So, and uh, we, so basically our activity is organized, if organizing the events. Uh, we focus in on IETF related activities. And also sometimes we translate IETF or ISOC related materials into Japanese, because sometimes language will be um, the obstacle for local people in Japan. And so next slide, please. So um, one of our chair doesn't want to, <laughs> but doesn't want to provide the picture. Um, <laughs> so there's no picture of the uh, our chair Toshio. But the, so basically there are five officers. Uh, Toshio is chair and vice chair is me Mariko, and program chair is Taiji, and treasurer is uh, Tomohiro, and secretary is Leo. So uh, be, um, I, I think a few people joined the IETF meeting and also. AP NIC APRICOM meeting too. So maybe you can find those people in some other event too. So next slide, please. And I would like to introduce the characteristics of our chapter. So firstly, our chapter is operated uh, based on totally voluntary manner. So we have uh, every officer and other program committee has uh, like nine, like nine a.m. to <laughs> six p.m. work, and after that we will have uh, events or we will have a uh, the biweekly meeting and so on. And we focus in because uh, there are 
high internet uh, high internet in internet usage rate in Japan already. So our focus is uh, rather than development of the internet, uh, we focus is more like internet governance or internet standard open in, in open internet standards uh, activity. And there are a lot of there are already a lot of existing internet radio community act actively in Japan. So um, we basically we collaborate with those existing organizations or, or communities to achieve ice mission. So next slide, please. So um, there are several committees and working groups in ISAC Japan chapter. Uh, one of them is program committee. Program committees we will. Uh, uh, the plan or we will do planning or preparing the events for local communities and others a the um the non -nom com system we had and uh, sometimes uh, this is a temporal committee but we have an internet hall for of fame nominating committee uh because every year we would like to exploring if there is somebody uh for good uh, for for good nomi nom nomination in the uh, from Japan Japanese community, and third one is Internet Standardization Promotion Committee. Uh, this is this community this committee focusing on IETF outreaching activities. And other working group is uh, we have the the pub working group. This is we pre we are making the flyers in Japanese and so on. And uh, we also have uh the the uh, the function collaborate with a large structure in ICANN. The next slide, please. And as a as a, as a member of ISOC, ISOC Japan chapter, we would like to introduce Toru Takahashi. I think some of you already know, but uh, unfortunately he has passed away in the end of the last year. He was a very dedicated person to developing the internet services in Japan, and also he was collaborating with the, the people outside of Japan to like to invite to introduce the, for example, the interlop system into intro conference into Japan and so on. Thank you. So our next slide, please. So we also work on localization content. Uh, in the past, we translated a few materials, for example, kids and the internet, uh, for the internet, uh, the children safe online, and also the, uh, there's, I think, accessibility uh, rep issue paper published by ISOC. So we translated, so some of our committee members are interest, is interested in accessibility. So they translated the, the English material into Japanese material in Japanese, then I introduced the local communities. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the uh, annual events we have a internet community showcase. Uh, this is a we organize an online recently online event, but uh, every spring around April or May we have an event to introduce internet related communities such as ISOC, IETF, Network Operators Group, IGF, and ICANN, and so on. And I think spring is a good moment for people who would be very open for find, starting the new activities, especially for, especially for young people. So we organize this kind of event in every year spring. Next slide, please. And we have a, the event on the PIR. I, I think most of uh, people will know about this issue, but the, uh, there is a the Dr. Esaki, uh, who is a previously the board member of ISOC, and the, uh, I think Akinori Maimura is also a well-known person in this community. But we invited those people, and we had a dialogue with, di dialogue with the local community about the, how do you think about PIL and what kind, what kind of plan in the future, and so on. Next slide, please. And we had... Uh, we also had a uh, uh, we we also have a collaborate event with ICANN. Uh, they would they they would they would like to uh, introduce the encrypted DNS to Japanese community. So we collaborate together to organ co-organize this event. And they introduced the encrypted DNS and also uh, the identity te technology health uh, indicators and so on. Next slide, please. 
And we also have a lot of other collaborative events, uh, for example, WCC TPAC and uh, TTC. TTC is a trade communication technology committee uh, in, in Japan. So we sometimes organize the event with collaborate with those existing internet communities in Japan. So next slide, please. And recently, we uh, we would like to encourage more uh, young people to participate internet or internet con related conferences or communities. So um, I saw JP also put efforts to encourage those people like how to join local or global internet communities. Now our target is twenty to thirties or the thirty five years old or <laughs> the kind of the the range of generation and uh, some of participants now work as a program committee member in ISAC Japan chapter. So I think it's a very uh, good example how to encourage youth participation. And now he, they, can, they, they are now one of the leadership position in ISAC Japan chapter. So uh, I, I think I'm a, one of the example of that, but next slide, please. And uh, this time we had an IETF in the past one year. So I would like to uh, introduce more IT related activities. The ISAC Japan chapter is uh, very focusing on the ITF outreach activity in Japan. Firstly, we introduced the Stack workspace for uh, local people. I think in the last week, there are more than 170 users in the Slack works in our Slack workspace, so they can exchange opinion. Or if there's the of uh, the the newcomers, they can ask for somebody or how can I participate in this working group and so on. So I think this is very good hub community to exchange in the opinions and comments or questions. And every after uh, IETF meeting, we organize update meeting. Uh, this is the organized uh, event we collaborate with JP Nick uh, every after ITF meeting to share what kind of discussion ha happened in the IETF meeting. And another and third one is we organized the like the get together for Japanese community in IETF. This is before COVID, so um, like we get we got together in the each restaurants, but the drink the. I think past a few years, we organized a get together on Zoom on you by using Zoom, and uh, but you know the the time zone is a bit weird <laughs> at the moment. So we had a get together online, but the, like but one p.m. or two, I know one a.m. or two a.m. Uh, we had that kind of the meeting, socialized meeting. It's a bit weird, but everybody uh, getting uh, well, uh, waking up to watch the working group meeting, so it was fine at the moment. So next slide, please. And in January, uh, the end of January, uh, we organized uh, the one big event in Japan to introduce IETF. And the, in, as a result, uh, more than uh, almost 140 participants joined our event. It was very successful. I think in uh, this in ITF Yokohama, like nearly 20% 20, percent, 20 percentage of participants was from uh, I think Japan. So I, I, I I'm very happy if our uh, event contributed to encourage local people to participate in IETF meeting. But the, in the event, uh, we introduced, of course, over, uh, overview of the idea, what is IETF and so on. And also we would like to uh, introduce a bunch of IETF ready tools. Uh, you need to remember, like data tracker, meet echo, Zurip. Um, it is a bit complicated. So we would like to introduce those IETF tools for newcomers. And of course, uh, we also introduced what is benefit of IT participation for Japanese local communities. And uh, we introduced the side meetings, social events, and uh, we had uh, one of Japanese NOC member in ITF. So he introduced how you can connect to the Wi-Fi in the venue and so on. So yes, so this, this, this event was very successful in a few months ago. The so next slide, please. 
So, um, so sorry for a very small text, but the, so this is the uh, related events happened in ISOC Japan chapter recently. Uh, for example, like the how to walk through the ITF was the most recent one. And we have AGM meeting and ITF update meeting. And uh, we had an ISOC Japan chapter workshop on internet, internet uh, related organization showcase and so on. The next slide, please. And we had a uh, so publicity activities. Uh, every I think a every a yes a, a few a few times like three or four times in a year we published the news newsletter on on Isaac Japan chapters activities. Uh, before COVID, we uh, we had a uh, physical flyers and we distribute in each event. But now we publish digital as a digital uh, newsletter. So next slide, please. So uh, this is a, our future activities. So of course, after IETF uh, 116, uh, we will definitely have updating meeting because a lot of people participate in IETF from Japan Japanese community. So we would like to introduce what have, we would like to introduce and share what happened. Also, we would like to encourage their future participation too. And um, I think this. Uh, 2023 is a very important year for Japanese community because a lot of uh, internet-related co internet conference will happen. IETF, APNIC, IGF. I think APNIC and IGF both will happen in Kyoto in the same venue. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so we would like to introduce what is IGF and so on to the Japanese communities. And uh, maybe we would like to... Uh, encourage, especially for young people to uh, read, uh, for example, the, 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 like, the blogs from APNIC, like iStock and so on, because some young people, some Japanese young people has uh, difficulties to, to see and check regular regu to, to see and check those news in English regularly. So we would like to uh, have some some events to introduce, but kind of like how, how you can read those blog posts in APNIC, right? ISOC and, and so on. And of course, uh, we will have, uh, uh, we, we will definitely have AGM every, every year at the end of the year, we have the AGM. So um, we will report what kind of activities happen and what is financial status and so on to local communities. So I think that's all. In, Yes, that's, that's all from my side. So uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to my presentation. I'm happy to um, answer the question or, or if you have any comments. I, I think I, I think you, <laughs> you uh, have a comment. You already have a bit of a queue. So I think we have Barry and then George and then Luis and then Sakarika. So, uh, and then Mohammed. So Barry, you start. Hi, this is Barry Liba. Thank you, Kobayashi-san, for, uh, for the report and for the work that your chapter does. I'm really excited to be coming back to Kyoto in October for IGF. Can you say a couple more words, perhaps, about what the chapter uh, intends to do re related to the IGF meeting? Thank you. Uh, please uh, take take a mask. Uh, <laughs> I need to take a uh, rest a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so sorry. So your your question was a the the activities regarding I, IGF in in Japan. So the uh, in fact I'm I collaborate with the the a lot of the organization related to Internet Governance Forum, and in I think in November in last year we launched the IGF task force Japan in Japan, so which is so that task force is towards to uh, IGF two thousand twenty three, and actually before that the internet governance community is a bit divided into Japan. There are several related communities, but uh, there was not a any meetings to connecting those rated organization. So we launched the task force and we invite um, representative from each organization. So now we can sit in the same table and discussing what, what kind of activities will happen or what kind of workshop we will, we will or what kind of 
for example, like uh, I think IG this year is the first time to organize IGF in Asia Pacific. So we also are very excited to share the what is a Asia Pacific immediate immediate issue and so on. So um, yeah, currently we have a. a the meeting once once a month, and uh, we also think we are also thinking about to launch some youth committee or something towards ITF to, uh, no no IGF two thousand twenty three. So yes, a, a lot of activities happen. But what currently we are doing is like launching the youth committee, and also uh, we we would like to uh, think about what kind of workshop workshop. Or workshops or open session, what kind of topic will good for those sessions? And uh, we will like encourage existing Japanese uh, organization, private sector or university to to submit those workshop proposal and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. George is next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. First of all, thanks for a really nice presentation. I, I, uh, it, this chapter looks really healthy. Uh, I, this is sort of a follow-on to Barry's question, but to 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 what a lot of your work is focused on IETF technical yes. matters. To what extent do you see the chapter as equally being involved, or should be involved, in matters above the applications level, that is, the political and the behavioral level uh, of internet governance on the internet, uh, things like disinformation and so on? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I think. When we had a meeting with the ISOC headquarters, especially like uh, Olaf mentioned about oh, ISOC Japan chapter seems like very techy <laughs> chapter in ISOC in, in, in compared with other chapters in ISOC, and I think in the past several years our focus is a very tech, especially we, we focus in on technology related to internet infrastructure, but recently especially. A few young, several young people are more interested in internet governance or policy layer related to technology. So I I hope this year will be the important uh, opportunity for us to encourage to to uh, to to encourage activities that like connect tech and non tech people in our communities. And also we would like to encourage more tech people to participate IGF, not only IETF and so on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Luis. Thank you, Mariko. And congratulations for all these activities you are reporting. I always admire the Japanese chapter for their youth involvement in the uh, in the organization, and the, um, this brings me into how you do it, how you bring <laughs> young people to get so involved into ISOC. Do you feel that the origins of the ISOC chapter uh, help to encourage people to participate? But it's amazing. I can say it's one of the chapters in the world that involve more young people into ISOC activities. And they do not feel like in other chapters with barriers to get involved. And also the um, in, in other theme, that's my question. And my congratulations, my question. And the, uh, uh, well, I was involved in, 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 in organizing June people for IGF in Mexico in 2016. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy to share ideas with you how to get people involved in, in this and congratulations again it's really exciting to see all this energy flowing into iso is what i think we need in, in all every chapter thank you thank you so much i think it's uh, i hope we, we still have a, a little bit time yeah it's okay so um so i think one of so i think uh this all of acti activities we had is not on, not only thanks to iso communities like it's thanks to a lot of other communities existing in Japan. So uh, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of active internet communities like Japan Network Operators Group and the uh, JP NIC and other IGF related activities happen in Japan. And what is our strength is we can always um, like collaborating to organize events. So if we, for example, if we organize uh, some events we can also outreach 
the the se several co committee or several stakeholders like and for example like not only private sectors we can invite somebody from university like professor or students from universities and sometimes uh, we collaborate with the uh, the, the Japanese government, for example, uh, Ministry of Internal, Internal Affairs, and so, so yeah, and and another uh, the characteristic of our community is a we I think compared with other country we have a we have a good relationship uh, with tech communities and uh, governments, like because the Japanese governments have been always supported the multi-stakeholder or open global internet. I think this is very uh, rare characteristic of the governments, you know? So they, they always, they, and also a lot, of, a lot of the professors from, from universities in Japan participate the, the government's council. So if something weird happened, they can shout out <laughs> inside of the council and they will uh, fix the direction of the ICT policy and so on. So I think uh, the relationship between tech and non-tech will be one of the strengths. And, uh, and another uh, aspect is uh, we have a lot of active existing organization and we can cooperate each other. So that 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 will um, makes that that will that 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 enable us to do those activities that I shared in the previous slides. Mohammed. Uh, yes, uh, I have to say that was a really impressive presentation. So thank you very much for that. Two questions. Uh, one, can you uh, tell us a little bit about the challenges that your chapter face and what you are doing about those? Uh, second, uh, are there any activities with regards to person with disabilities? Uh, do you do? Uh, do you have any members, or uh, is chapter doing something about that? Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, excuse me. Can you repeat the first question again? The challenges uh, that your chapter may be facing or you think that you are facing and what you are trying to deal with those challenges? Uh, je, je, je ne... Challenges. Genetics. Yes. Issues. Uh, challenges. Oh, got it. The challenges in our chapters comment, our chapters members. Fee. Yes. So, um, Oh, sorry, I, I, I still uh, did not figure out the first question. So are, are there any difficulties that the chapter might encounter in the near future? And how, what would you do about that? Uh, in general. And second question is on um, disability and accessibility. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. And so I think so, so, uh, let me uh, answer the first, from the first question. So uh, the difficulties is a... so. As I talked in the, the first or second slides, the ISOC Japan chapter is operated based on completely voluntary manners. So sometimes the uh, we they, they're difficult like they're part they're a like limited capacity for us to organize something or collaborate with something because the, everybody has their main other job and it's very difficult sometimes difficult to um, provide enough uh, capacity uh, with, uh, uh, with when we collaborated with other organization to 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 organize the event but uh, and uh, currently we so so I I saw Japan chapter is uh, has does not has a um, the 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 regal entity yet. So that is currently one of the uh, most uh, the, 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 the most challenging topic in our chapter. Like, in fact, we are preparing, uh, making the report, like how can we make the ISOC Japan chapter into regal entity in Japan? Like it's a bit di uh, difficult uh, process in, in Japan, but if we had a like nonprofit organization and that kind of certificate, we can also use Slack for nonprofit organizations to be late and discount and so on. So, but uh, we, we are still exploring about that point. So that's, that is my answer to your first question. And second question is, um, there are definitely a few, there are a few people in our program community are interested in the accessibility and disability, 
And um, I think a few years ago, we had a, a event to for inviting one of the ISOC, JP, ISOC Japan chapter member. Uh, he, he's a programmer, but also at the same time, he's blind. So he shares uh, what is difficulties that happen and what is the issue in accessibility and the software development perspective and so on with our communities. But uh, I think regarding disability in accessibilities, uh, there are already a lot of active uh, community uh, existed in Japan, especially regarding the web developing communities, they are very uh, doing great job uh, regarding the, the disability and accessibility and so on. So we would like to collaborate those existing community to encourage the, the access, the diversity and inclusion related activities also in Japan, Japanese community. Thank you, Sagarika. Hello, uh, I'm Sagrika. Congratulations to the Japan chapter. And I would like to ask two questions. One is like, uh, I would just want to know because in APAC, Asia Pacific, there are many chapters who may be having thousand odd members. But being an early chapter, early founded chapter, you still have 465 members kind of. So what is your strategy to getting members? Like how do you get members? Do you have screening process kind of things? like and uh, the second thing is uh, like role model mm -hmm. i would like you to be nominated as a role model chapter for the effect agent so what is your like collaboration decisions like collaborative efforts with the other chapters in the region mm -hmm. thank you so a so firstly uh we we didn't have the much sophisticated process regarding calling for members to ISAC Japan chapter. But it, it's more like when, when the officers or program committee members uh, meet somebody who might be interested in the ISAC Japan chapter missions and uh, some the, the events, like we, we just directly con contacted or encountered that person and it very encouraged, oh, please join our <laughs> chapters and so on. And so, so in that kind of way, like we we were gradu gradually uh, encouraged the local participation in the ISAC uh, Japan chapter and so on. And secondly, uh, towards IGF 2023, uh, the we we are we started to have a conversation with the USIG in you 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 standing group in ISOC Japan uh, I, I, ISOC Internet Society to maybe we, we might have some collaboration regarding the youth development in IGF. So we, we had started to uh, the, the conversation. And uh, I also had a conversation with interplanetary chapter in ISOC. I think they recently launched the interplanetary chapter. It is very exciting project, I think. And they also emphasize the youth uh, the opinion or or comments from youth will be very important to developing the future internet internet. So I would have if we can do something maybe in IGF like to organize an open session together or something. And uh, I think in like a few years ago we had a um, the the IGF Pacific Regional Leadership meeting or something. Like we, we we could meet other chapters reader in person, so we had a like di like pretty full dialogue dialogue discussion together. But recently, it turns out it turns in online for format, and it's a bit I feel it's a bit difficult to uh, know directly readership in readership position in other chapters in Asia Pacific. So if there if, if I, I thought well. <laughs> Are interested in the organized such readers like readership meeting in, in Asia Pacific like in, as a in per, the format in person. Um, I think that will very helpful to to exploring opportunities to collaborate in with other chapters in the same region. Thank you, Charles. Yes, uh, Mariko, thank you very much for your presentation and. Uh, Congratulations for the success and the uh, continued success of the Japan chapter. Uh, I, I, I just actually echoing many of the things that were said by other trustees. Um, I, I, I do, I hope to encourage the 
Japan chapter to continue to share more about your experience and how you make the chapter work. Like many of the factors that people talked about, you're very active, you are very strong, particularly on, uh, on technical issues, working very closely with government as well as uh, many of the internet related organizations in Japan and internationally. So all these things, how do you do it? And also, and also uh, uh, working very, very well with young people and so on. So, uh, and continuity, you seem to have a very good uh, continuity among your chapter and your people and so on. Uh, so how do you make it work? I think there are a lot of these experience that, that many other chapters will benefit from you, uh, first within the Asia region and then uh, obviously all around the world as well. So I do want to encourage you to continue to find ways of doing that. And I think we've heard a few things about how, you know, some of the issues or suggestions that you might have uh, talked about, like maybe there needs to be more face-to-face -face, uh, gatherings uh, for the region and so on that hasn't happened for some time. Uh, or, uh, but I also think that, you know, uh, many of these issues that you face in Japan, in terms of even the internet governance issues and the policy issues, data governance issues and so on, uh, Japan actually can be a good example for many of the other countries in uh, first in this region and then maybe the world. So uh, more participation, not just in the ITGF, but of course IGF because it's going to be in Kyoto. So, so that's convenient, but also uh, within the APR IGF, I think you should have a lot yeah. more opportunities to share there more actively. So I, I, I just want to encourage you to, to do that. And maybe, you know, if there's anything that we can help to lead, uh, connect you better with other chapters, uh, I think I, uh, the board and, uh, and many of our trustees will be very happy to help you do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your comments. And I'm, I, I appreciate your comments on like our, our challenging changing and activities happen in ISAC and Japanese communities. And uh, uh, I have a one question for uh, the ISAC board members. Like, do, do you have any do you have any plans for a do they have any plans for organizing some events or session, especially organized by ISAC in, in, in IGF in Kyoto? <laughs> um, can you hear is this on okay uh yes yeah, so we are um um getting organized just like you um um for kyoto and we had some excellent meetings this week with um the japanese government and a number of um stakeholders in, mm -hmm. the, in the communities and with you about um kyoto so we're quite excited about that and yes um we are are considering workshop proposals, um, uh, considering, um, and certainly would want to do some um, coordination with the chapter on potential chapter activities that we could do together um, uh, on the occasion of the IGF. Uh, so, so yes, we'll be there and um, active and, and would certainly um, wanna keep the discussions that began this week um, going in preparation for the event. Thank you. I, I think, uh, the, the kind of the, the opportunity uh, if we have a the the like open session or workshop especially by especially organized by ISOC would be a good opportunity to exchanging the 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 best practice from each chapter and so on so I I, I was thinking about that idea but if you have any plans to organize in Kyoto uh, I'm always uh, happy to hear about the details if, if there's something corroborate we can together uh, we are always open about that option so please uh, let us know uh, if you have any specific uh, plans and uh, of course if we have uh, any uh, workshop or like session planning in the future uh, and if I need if, if we need a uh, uh, ISOC help uh, we will contact <laughs> you and so thank, thank you so much. And I'm very uh, happy uh, to um, ha happy to have more opportunities to exchanging our best, best practice with, between the chapters, especially in Asia Pacific. Well, let me summarize the, the feelings of the board by saying we really appreciated this, this presentation. There's a lot of great work going on in your chapter <clears throat> and a lot of opportunity in the future. Uh, so we thank you very much for, for your time today and for all of the great work. And we look forward to continuing to work together, not just in 
the upcoming IGF in Kyoto, but uh, from then on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna take a short break now. Uh, uh, there's, I believe, refreshments out in the hallway um, uh, for those who'd like to partake. Uh, thanks everybody and welcome back. We, we thank uh, uh, our, our colleague uh, Lars Eggert for his report, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, now we move into the committee reports and the first committee report is from the election committee. Thanks, Teth. Thanks everybody. Well, as you know, we have a running election and the uh, has been a quite smooth process. Any process is far from perfect, but the uh, uh, we have some minor issues I'm going to point out, but the, um, well, the, uh, just to make a review, uh, last nine, uh, 29 of November, we started this process opened by the nominations committee. So now it's time for me to thank the nominations committee and all the colleagues at the, uh, at the board that have participated in the nominations and the elections committee because of contributing to these uh, encouraging results. Yes, also I want to thank the staff and especially Lauren for their efforts to keep this process running as smooth as possible. Yes, so we have less trouble to worry about. The, um, so after these nominations, self-nominating individuals or other individuals nominating other people for chapters and the organizational members. Yes, the, the slates were announced by the 15th of February. Uh, that's when the uh, most of the important work by the nominations committee nearly finished. The, um, then we had six, uh, six candidates for two seats on the, um, for, for the chapters constituency, let's say like that. And for the organizational members, we have uh, one seat and we have then two candidates. After petitions, we raise one candidate on each side. So now we're talking about seven candidates running for two seats in the, um, in the uh, chapter's uh, election and three seats on the, uh, three candidates for one seat on the um, member uh, organizational members uh, election, right? The um, I should say that we have uh, on the chapter side a couple of candidates uh, running for re-election, which are George and Mohammed. Yes, and on the organizational side, we have Ted as a, uh, seeking for re-election. The um, we have unfortunately only one woman on each side running for the um, as a candidate. So I think we should motivate women to participate more. We have discussed this a lot. The, the amount of women participating in the industry, which really needs to be improved in in a global manner. Yeah, the um, 17th of March we opened the forum. Yes, candidates forum this year. Uh, candidates forum has been less active than past two years, which I have seen three three years I have seen, and the uh, we are not sure, but there is no technical issue. It's something related how people want to participate, and again I see from the chapters, the chapter leaders. Uh, less participation, but maybe it's just the time when people are coming out of, 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 of all the things we suffer from uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So they need to focus in other business and they need to keep things running up. So the uh, that may be held in people from um, participating in a more active way. Although we, we got some peaceful discussions in the in the, in, especially in the uh, chapter selection uh, list. Uh, 
there's still some technical issues on the list. There were some complaints which shouldn't be taken as a, as a problem, uh, let's say unfairness or, or disparity because of the, there is some moderation. This moderation can be improved, but it needs to be moderated. Yes, the, uh, in an um, ambience like uh, uh, ISOC uh, mailing list, you need moderation, yes, because people sometimes abuse. That has happened in the past. Um, yeah, it shouldn't go on. And the, um, the, the other thing is was a technical, minor technical issue, but the, uh, well, that precluded the, the mails to be um, identified as uh, valid. So it was solved, it was sorted out. And the, um, so the today, well, first hour today, the members and the um, organizational members and election and chapter members uh, list closed and the ballots were distribute, distributed as uh, already planned. This voting will be closing by the 14th of April. Uh, today we have 122 chapters eligible to be to vote and 90 organizational members to vote. Yes, uh, about one hour ago we had nine organizational members voting. That means 10 percent. Yes, and 23 chapters voting. That's about 18 percent. So it's it's uh, it's coming. Uh, after the voting closes by the 14th of April, then they will be in this challenging period. Then uh, we will know from Andrew if the, there were challenges and if so, how they were sorted out. Uh, so the final results are announced on the 5th of May. And uh, that's it. I'm happy for any question you may have or comment. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments for Luis or the committee? Okay, uh, Charles. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to give very quickly the uh, governance committee report and also uh, using this opportunity to share with you a revised chapter and hopefully getting the approval of the board for that. Uh, we had four meetings uh, since October of last year. So we pretty much had uh, two meetings, uh, 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 no, uh, one meeting every two months. So uh, it's been pretty productive. So I want to thank the members of the committee, uh, Victor, Barry, Shabir, and uh, George, Sakarika, and of course, Andrew, uh, for their participation and help. And also, of course, uh, Lauren's uh, very great support for the proceedings of the uh, meetings and all the preparation and so on. So we basically uh, handled a number of uh, issues in these meetings. The first one was, you know, trying to figure out actually what our action plan is going to be uh, for the year. So according to that, uh, which we quickly agreed, uh, first we of course have to uh, finalize the nomination committee guidelines, uh, which we actually didn't make a lot of changes at all because basically we were also very much pressed on, on time and the NOMCOM uh, pretty much has been operating quite uh, if, uh, efficiently anyway. So we quickly approved the uh, guidelines for the NOMCOM uh, and we spent most of the time of the rest of the meetings on two main issues. Uh, the first one is the uh, governance committee charter, which I'll go back to, and also the uh, board uh, self-assessment, uh, which we conducted. And I'll go into uh, a report of that later on in the in this meeting. So going back to the governance committee char charter, we, uh, well, uh, we reviewed and updated the charter to basically try to better reflect uh, standard sector practices of NGOs, non-government non, uh, non uh, organizations and so on. So uh, we, 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 we noticed that the charter was actually last revised back in 2017, so it's been a while. And we know that uh, sometimes some of these sector practices do change from time to time. So we wanna take a holistic review of the practices 
uh, based on some of the resources we get from board source, the company that we also use for our our uh, board review, uh, to look at some of the other nonprofit governance, uh, uh, non governance uh, organizations and how they are uh, governing themselves. So we identified a number of areas that uh, we need to take a look at, basically including uh, board composition, board success, uh, succession, uh, planning, committee, composition, and ongoing uh, uh, education. And these are some of the areas that were not previously reflected in our governance committee uh, charter before. So uh, we, we, so uh, Lauren, can you show, should we show that uh, on, on the, because I think you can get it to it on the board effect, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the charter, revised chapter charter that we want to get your approval of. Uh, so that, uh, so I, I guess uh, trustees can go to that and look, go to the board uh, source and look at that. Uh, the, uh, the, it seems like we have uh, made a lot of changes, but actually most of it is basically uh, just re reorganizing some of the orders of the uh, of the of the con content, uh, and uh, it, it it looks like it's been a lot of changes, but actually it's just uh, a lot of reorganization. So it, again, uh, we we focused on possibly. Uh, trying to include in the charter of the governance committee some of these uh, issues that we that I mentioned, like composition the, of the board, uh, succession planning, and uh, and committee composition and education. But we also did not some include uh, some of the practices that were uh, that were uh, uh, that were you know, uh, that were refers to us as uh, issues that we might want to take a look at, but we didn't include, for example, like uh, recruitment effort, uh, because we do have other processes in ISOC to handle that with our nomination committee and our election committee and so on. So we didn't want the governance committee to over to overlap with those. So why don't you have a question? Yes. Uh, uh, thanks very much for, for taking this holistic view and, and presenting this. I have to say when I was reading uh, the section on develop and maintain the board matrix a chart that reflects the various perspectives, experience, skills, diversity, et cetera. This, this new section of the uh, uh, governance committee charter, so in, in the red line, there's no, uh, basically it's the part that starts board and composition, board and committee composition and succession planning, and it ends with identify, recruit, and recommend candidates for board membership for the board appointed trustees position. There's a good bit of that where um, historically the, the ISOC board has delegated that to the nominations committee. Um, <clears throat> and one of the consequences of that is the nominations committee cannot have anybody sitting on it who is a candidate. Uh, the elections committee also cannot have anybody sitting on it as a candidate. And reading this, I, I felt like that this was significant enough in terms of kind of setting the um, the direction of the election, that I began to worry that we would also not have anybody able to sit on the governance committee uh, who was a candidate, and that begins to be a bit of a problem, right? If we have three committees where um, nobody who's up for re-election can sit, um, we we kind of have a logistical problem in, in spreading the the work of the board across uh, some pretty important stuff. Um, and so, although this is this is a proposal to change just one committee's charter, I think it does have some ramifications across the others. And we might want to, to ask ourselves how much of this um, would would turn around and affect the composition of the governance committee or the other committees. Like, if if this means that you could serve on the nominations committee while you're self candidate, which seems unlikely. Um, or whether it would also have that other consequence would be something I'd, I'd appreciate some further discussion. And it looks like Andrew wants to start. Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, are you suggesting then that um, that this board committee composition and succession planning is an important function, but actually it really ought to be the nomcom? Um, because one, you know, an alternative would be to push this to the nomcom, but make the nomcom's job bigger, and therefore it doesn't like have the sort of startup and ending kind of 
pattern that it, it has had historically. So I definitely think that's one possibility here. The difficulty with that is the way we've currently got the nominations committee structured, a fair number of its members are not trustees. And that in turn would mean that developing and maintaining the board matrix would be more difficult because some of those, those members would not necessarily have the same experience. So I think we, if, if, <laughs> So I think our, our options here are if, if we're going to, to, to do this inside the governance committee, uh, then we have to consider whether the membership of the governance committee needs to be restricted. If we're not going to do this in the governance committee and do it in the nominations committee, whether that might have like a two-stage um, membership where uh, it's during the, the development of the, uh, of the board matrix, et cetera, it's board members. And then once that is complete, it seeks outside members. I think that would actually match this as an intent quite well, but it would mean that we actually need a different red line to a different committee. Yeah, uh, Ted and Andrew, thank you for that point because I actually do not particularly recall that we discussed that particular issue. Maybe we didn't think about the membership issue of the governance committee and your point about, you know, not, <laughs> you know, so many people will probably be excluded because of that. So we probably didn't uh, consider that. So I think I want to hear more views from, you know, our community members as well as other trustees on this particular issue. Uh, what do you feel about the best way going forward? Because I, I certainly am you know, trying to facilitate this, but I'm not trying to make a decision on what's going to do, what we we're going to do with this committee and this particular charter. So that was a point that we probably didn't consider. So one possibility like Ted was mentioning might be a two-stage membership type of a situation, or maybe we would be thinking more about the governance committee setting up some of these directions and programs, but not directly involved in identifying and recommending uh, particular candidates, but thinking about it at a high level uh, to try to put into place programs with I within ISOC and the board to try to uh, expand the kind of uh, 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 you know, board diversity that we're trying to get at. Whether or not that would satisfy or, or uh, you know, uh, avoid the kind of conflict of interest that uh, could possibly uh, happen. Uh, so just to confirm my understanding, you're, you're then thinking you would keep this as it is, except the bullet that's specific, identify, recruit, and recommend candidates for board membership uh, for the board appointed trustee positions? Possibly, if we need to change that wording a little bit, instead of directly saying that we are recruiting and re recommending candidates, but uh, identify, but but something like uh, 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 create the kind of strategies to help the organization to recruit, identify, or or maybe the nomcom specifically saying the nomcom uh, to you know, delegating that particular uh, 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 work uh, uh, and responsibility uh, to the nomcom in this particular. I don't know whether or not again. I don't know whether or not that is appropriate though. So, for one committee to 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 mention another committee what they are trying to do, but uh, but maybe talking more about ISOC in general, the governance committee would identify ways of uh, for the organization to uh, better or um, uh, re better identify ways of uh, improving board direct diversity, saying saying it in such a way rather than uh, in. In this particular way, it, it sounds like we're actually directly identifying or recommending candidates. So I saw Luis, uh, Andrew, and George in Q, and Mohammed as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mine is just uh, the. Uh, I think it's complicated for the, uh, the for the we're discussing now. But the uh, one of the things that we should take in mind is in, in this election process when we were trying to recruit members for the nomination committee and the elections committee, it was really complicated because there were no volunteers, okay? So the, uh, the, the, uh, it took longer in the organizational election 
to get volunteers to serve in the nominations committee and the elections committee, right? So the um, so we need to take that into consideration. If volunteering is complicated, I cannot imagine when the, you, you want to appoint someone and you need to run a formal process of nominating. It's going to be eternal. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the, the, the list has grown in kind of things. So John, I think you're next, then Andrew, although he may defer to Alona, then George, Mohammed, and Laura. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm wondering how much the actual process we will engage for point, uh, board appointed trustee positions, you know, will be a bespoke one every time, right? As opposed to something that we would formally delegate to something like the nominating committee. I think it it, it would be asynchronous with the processes that Lewis and I are executing, right? In the sense of it, it doesn't have the same time dependencies, doesn't have the same candidate pool con uh, dependencies and things like it. And so, I mean, I, I could certainly see there being a mandate for the governance committee to help articulate what that bespoke process is that will need to be conducted every time there's going to be a board appointed trustee uh, process. But yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't see why that should share fate with either the NOMCOM or the elections committee. Uh, so Andrew, did you defer to Alona? Yes. Alona. Andrew. All right, we're going to play uh, musical chairs here. So I, I mean, the 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 one thing that I will notice here is that it, it's actually really quite important that we have some of these functions, and and so I sort of don't care whether we move it to the nomcom or have it in the governance committee. Although I I think the point about non trustees being involved in that is pretty important, um, but. Some of this stuff is like really genuinely required by the IRS and we're not doing it now. So, um, or we are doing it, but we're doing it somewhat informally, I think is, is a, a better way to put that. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I would like this to show up in some committee's charter just for the obvious reason that it, it, it improves our documentation of the processes that we're actually undergoing. George? George? Well, one other alternative, which I don't particularly like, uh, it's imperfect, is to uh, uh, leave the charter the way it's been recommended and then have the, anybody who's running for the board, it would be me in this case this year, um, since I'm a member of the governance committee, uh, to recuse myself uh, in, uh, whenever this is discussed. That, that's really sloppy. And uh, I would say, having chaired the NOMCOM twice, uh, I think a, a multi-stage process in the NOMCOM with board members only and then expanding to include non-board members as is required by the charter uh, would, would work. Mohammed? I think I would uh, defer because John has already said what I wanted to say. Thank you. Laura. Struggling for the mute button. Yeah, I think there's, there's two things to me here. One is, you know, we, we don't want to, have this, I think it's already difficult to get a sufficient number of people participating on all of the committees. So if anything we have that sort of constrains membership further seems like a bad thing. Um, I don't actually care where the responsibility for this recruitment lies, but I think we should be crystal clear about where it is and make sure that it's like clearly demarked. Um, that, that seems pretty important. Uh, so I'm gonna ask for a couple of straw polls. And, and just this is just as a, uh, a way of sensing how people are, are thinking about this. And the three questions I'm going to ask are, uh, is anybody opposed to this language appearing in some committee charter? Uh, and and we'll, we'll take that as then a question that will inform the second one, um, which is, does anybody believe that if it's in the governance committee charter, this excludes uh, candidates from the governance committee and then the third will be if, if we did go to a two-stage nominations committee charter, does anybody have concerns about that? And so those don't necessarily, um, I, I'm, I realize they sort of presume what the answers are and my apologies for that, but I, if the first one comes out differently, we can always change the other two. Uh, so first, is there Could anybody clarify who, the third one though? Uh, so, so the 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 third one is: should we move this to the nominations committee? Uh, would anybody object to then also moving the nominations committee to a two stage membership so that it starts with just as opposed to the option that Charles suggested, which is to modify the language 
here on the governance committee that then would sort of send it on to the nominations committee. I thought that that well, well, one one option might be to change the language slightly, and Alona, Ilona, maybe you can help me make sure it's okay. Like, oh, it, uh, the the second last point on put on two is to oversee board succession planning and make recommendation to the board regarding uh com committee composition and 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 officer role. Maybe change that to include the third point, the, the last point, to say, say that you know oversee oversee board succession planning uh, and uh, making recommendation to the board regarding the, well, just include that. So, well, just it basically to, 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 to eliminate the last point, to make it a uh, less directly talking about identifying and recommend, yeah, yes. recommending yes. specific candidates. So I think- Because that, that really seemed to be a yeah. little bit, yeah, unfortunately we didn't have a joint meeting, maybe we should have. Uh, uh, at the time with the NOMCOM. Otherwise, that particular overlap might have been cited. So I think the point George was making uh, about recusal comes in there, right? So if you're part of the governance committee and the governance committee is in essence the one that's writing the job description for the year, um, then you, you, you functionally, if you're a candidate, have to recuse from that. So that's an that's another possibility, maybe a yes. little bit sloppier, but it, it's that's possible. another possibility, which is to you know keep it as as it is, but uh, having the possible candidate trustee to recuse themselves. So I think none of the candidate trustees in the governance committee can be uh, candidates for board appointed seats, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're already seated, yeah. and they're going for election through the existing process. Yeah. So there's a there 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 really are two different processes yeah. running here that are one 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 runs at a different sure, cycle right. than the other. So I think we're we're okay there. But let me go back to the first question. Does anybody object to having this uh, approximately this language appear somewhere in the committee charters? Do we agree that this needs to be added for clarity? to somebody's plate. So very quickly, what's the this? Oh, we have sure, a lot of uh, the, it's going, going back to the red line here, in the proposed resolution, the red line starting at board and committee composition and succession planning and running through identify, recruit and recommend uh, candidates for board membership for the board appointed trustee position. Thanks. Okay, uh, does anybody object to us finding a place in the committee charters uh, to, to include substantially this language. Any just straw poll issues with that that people want to raise at this time? Ilona, you're going to raise, so, this yeah. is your language. No, no, I was just going to say though that the first bullet point and the second bullet point is what the governance committee is supposed to do right now because that's essentially the guideline. The, yeah, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll get to the, figuring out the split okay. later. Don't, don't, don't. I, I guess when you put it, any committee, this language green, any committee? Yeah, okay, because if there are bespoke committees that are formed in order to do like these board appointments, asynchronously from everything else, of course, I'm okay with that language being in their scope. It is their job to identify, recruit, and recommend candidates for board membership. But like, I, I don't think there's some standing committee that should have this power or, or that makes sense to. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you to, to, to expand on that a little bit. I mean, in, how, under what circumstances do we believe we are going to invoke the power to appoint, yeah, have board, board appointed trustees? Do we think that that is power we're going to invoke monthly? Right. We're going to invoke that in an as needed basis. And I would be perfectly okay with constituting committees for that purpose that would have this mandate at such a time as that is required. Rather than having this be like a standing responsibility uh, you know, all the things above that, it's, it's only that last bullet that identify, recruit, and recommend candidates for board membership part that is making me push back on that. Yeah, I, I think the point is, is that board appointed trustee positions are not currently a responsibility of the NOMCOM. So it has to be a, a responsibility of somebody. It either has to be, you know, entirely taken up by the board itself or recommended by, let's say, the governance committee, or if we want to change the uh, responsibility of the NOMCOM to take over that responsibility as well, but somebody has to do it. That, okay, that okay so I have Barry, George, and Andrew, and then Lewis. So I think what, uh, if I interpret John's 
comment correctly, what I what it sounds like he wants, and I think I agree with him, is uh, so the board takes it up and says we have a need for this now, and constitutes a committee to deal with it, and that that's. I don't object to putting it in the governance committee or the nominating committee, but I think John's approach is probably best well, of the bunch. Because it, it's creating con contamin contamination that caused this whole chain of argument about, well, then, you know, there's a conflict of interest, everybody who was on the governance committee for this, right? That That's why I'm pushing back. Uh, so it, do you need to make a comment now or do you want to get in queue? Yeah, it's just about that. Then you need to, okay. you know, Mike. Yeah, it's just about that point, because the board appointed trustee position is not going to be in conflict with anybody running for re-election, right, right. right? Because you all have um, elected mm -hmm. some or selected somebody to serve on the board now. She's going to start at the AGM in June. So her term is going to be done in three years, and that's going to be nobody who's going to be running for re-election then for that position is going to be somebody else. So I don't see the conflict here between the NOMCON and the governance committee. Uh, so I have George, Andrew, Luis, uh, Victor. I'm going to pass. I don't want to add to the confusion. <laughs> Andrew, do you want to add to the confusion? That's my middle name. Um, I, my middle name is getting longer every time. Um, uh, the, the thing that is nice about this, um, to, to respond directly to John's concern, is that it then identifies the place that this is going to happen, if it's going to happen at all. What if instead of instead of instead of making this smaller or removing it, what about making it larger so that the governance committee is actually responsible for ex for recommending that this be exercised and then responsible for finding the um, the candidate and so forth. So, so in any given year, you the, the governance committee says, "Hey, wait a minute, we've um, like declined in diversity. Therefore, we need to, or you know, it's not the same, or whatever. Therefore, you need to uh, you need to exercise this thing." And then the board says, "Okay, yes." And then the committee says, "Okay, we're going to go and do this." Would that satisfy your your concern about this? Yes. Okay. Isn't that what we? Uh, so wait, we have Luis, Victor, and now Pepper. Okay. The. Uh... From my point of view, the board appointed positions are something that happens not on a regular basis. Yes, it's something extraordinary. And the NOMCOM and the elections committee, they we work in the regular basis. Just, so I agree that the, the this process, this extraordinary process should be residing in the governance committee as the uh, it's going to be something that is not regular not normal not under the the established rules yes so it needs another set of rules which should be similar to the other ones thank you okay so got victor pepper and me and and mohammed okay so two points one i guess to lona the one challenge might be from that position that you'd raise is that one might assume that there might be an advantage of someone who's board appointed to some future elected position, right? I'm not saying that exists, but it could be construed as that. So, but I don't see that as a huge issue, but one could bring that argument in the future, right? If the person was selected, now later on, they might have some advantage position. I'm not sure if that's a bad thing or not. I'm just saying that someone could bring it up. But I think to the point that Andrew raised, I think that the way it was worded might help because if you have it written as one committee does have the responsibility to flag it to be done, but you require board agreement to then exercise it, and then you go off and do the work, it removes the potential, the, the issue. It, it helps establish that there is a known way to do it on an ongoing basis, right? Like you, fly, you know, the governance committee flags it. However, the board has to agree. So the, the, that, that committee can't just go off and start to do something without board part. Anyway, those are my two points. Uh, Pepper and then. I agree with what Victor said. And I think Andrew, what you just, what you said describes what we've done. That's all we, that's what we did. That's it. We created a special committee, well, special committee but, if, but if in fact we had done that as part of within the governance committee, 
Right. That, 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 that's that, what I was trying to yeah, suggest. And I, and I think that that actually does solve the problem. Okay. And I, so I'm agreeing with what you just articulated because it then creates a process, if needed, going to, you know, the point of, that this is extraordinary, right? Um, um, Mohammed, then Ilona, then me. Uh, I think uh, also that uh, we we need to document this somewhere, and governance committee seems to be the appropriate place. Uh, what if uh, we say in two years' time, the the governance committee suggests to the board that whether we are we meeting the diversity requirements that we we have, we need to increase it. Uh, so in two years time, the governance committee can suggest to the board that what should uh, this board do, whether it should, uh, it, it needs to appoint uh, a member or not. Uh, but I think it should reside within the uh, governance committee, uh, having some language that it needs to fulfill some diversity requirements or something like that. Alona? I think I was just going to respond back, I think, to Victor's point about um, um, whether it, where it resides. But at the end of the day, the board is going to either appoint or not appoint that trustee by two thirds. So there, it's still the power is in with the, within the, this board. It's just the question is which who is doing the legwork, who's going to go and look for the candidate. And again, because this has not happened before, this was a, a, a special setup committee, but really the function lives within the governance committee. I would say you are on so many committees. It's a small board. It's a volunteer board. There is so much work already that you're all doing that to then set up yet another committee and not have the charter or not have, you know, this was a lot of work on all of you and on us to try and get this candidate identified and then appointed that I think have some kind of strategy and have it live within the governance committee where it's supposed to live makes perfect sense. Uh, supposed to live. Many of us don't live where we're supposed to live. I, I warn you we're of that right now. Um, I, I would like to ask the, the, the governance committee uh, for forbearance to, to suggest two things. One, I think there's some parts of this which are clearly meant to apply to ongoing operation, how it works every year, especially that they're meant to apply in years where there is no external, uh, when, when there's no uh, board appointment. And there are some parts of this uh, which are specific to the years where there is a board appointment. Um, so I would like to ask if the governance committee would consider um, rephrasing this so that these are in two different uh, areas of the of the charter, so it's a little bit clearer which ones are uh, uh, meant to apply constantly and which ones are specific. Because I think some of the concerns I'm having, it sounds like are around sections that other people believe are for this extraordinary measure. Um, if that's acceptable, I would then like the committee to make a specific recommendation as to whether the implication is that people who are candidates are eligible to serve on the governance committee or not. Because I think we need to be crystal clear about that as we evaluate um, the charter because it will tell us where things fall or not. And I think part of my reason for that actually goes back to the point about how we did this recruitment process. As you'll recall, we didn't actually run an open call and get candidates, we did a recruiting process. We had a, a the, the special committee went, developed what it wanted, and um, maybe the governance committee would be the one that does this in the future, but then went with the recruiter, found somebody, and we basically said, everybody has to agree on who this is because we're not going to be very happy if it comes back into the, um, the final board and board members are like, no, this isn't the person we want because we would have really burned a very serious bridge to do that. And what we did to avoid that is to say, everybody who wants to be on the recruitment committee can join it. So if, if, if you are either joining the recruitment committee or you are committing to hold your peace and that worked well, we can't do the same thing with the governance committee and say, because there might be at some point in the future, a recruitment here, if you want to have a, a 
a piece of that pie, you got to join the governance committee at the beginning of the year, because then we're going to end up with a governance committee that, in fact, then has everybody on it who might ever want to have a piece of that pie. So I think what I, I feel like we need here is a little bit more clarity on which pieces of this apply only to the, the, the special case recruitments and which don't, and a, a direct consideration from the governance committee about whether they think this is disqualifying for candidates or not. And, and I think that would, that would help us get to the next stage of this. Does that make sense? I, I just want to make sure you, you're talking about the conflict of the person who might be a candidate for the board, of, board appointed trustee position? No, I'm no. talking about the fact that this, as it re reads now, each year the board matrix is evaluated, uh, each, each year use the board matrix to evaluate the board's current mm. composition and recommend an ideal candidate profile to inform the nominations committee work and other board recruitment activities. Mm. So because that's writing the board description and it means basically Ultimately, this is might end up saying, you know, we currently have four different lawyers on the board, um, three of whom are are, are up for uh, review. We only need two. That that's something that if you're one of the other two lawyers or, or even any of the four, you might not want to be part of the committee that decided that. Unless you're you yourself are tired of lawyers, which I hear happens among lawyers pretty frequently, um, but I think that means that we need clarity. For the even for the parts that are um, ongoing operations and not these special purposes, about whether or not this is disqualifying to uh, potential candidates. Pepper, you had a question. Yeah, in, in looking at the specific language, it it makes an assumption that there's a problem. And so I guess Charles, the question is, on the language, you know. You know whether a remedy is even needed before, and if there if not, then do you need an ideal candidate? Uh, so Ilona is raising her hands to say it, it could mean we want exactly what we've already got. Ilona, I wanted to say that you need as many lawyers as you can get on your board. <laughs> <laughs> One would be nice. <laughs> uh, hey, no, um, no, but <laughs> what I was gonna say actually um, in response to Ted's point or actually I'll start with you, Pepper. Um, you, the governance committee is doing that already. The ideal candidate, and maybe ideal is what bothers people, but the candidate is what the guidelines are supposed to be all about from the governance committee going down to the NUMCOM. Here's the guidelines and here's what we're looking for this year. And here's our board composition this year. And this is what you, know, you need. Um, so that's, it's just basically saying, we'll add on another layer, which is the board matrix. And to answer Tad's concern, it's not about, hey, we have this many we don't need anymore. It's more about, okay, lawyers check. We also need policy, we also need this. And so it's, it's basically adding rather than subtracting. So it's not saying we don't need any more. What we're saying is this is what we need for the following year because somebody else may not be running because they they you know they're they're at their six years so we're losing policy person on the board right so it's not we don't need any more it's we need more of this if that makes sense uh, thank you for that clarification I, I will say that um the way it currently works I, I think we've talked about this is a bit more ad hoc and I think it's much more idealized you know we we describe what the ideal board candidate looks like some in a, similar to what we say to the PIR board, right, when we're, we're recruiting for that, we put out all of the different things um, that might be valuable in a board member. And then it's up to the nomcom to pick among them based on its understanding of what might be missing in the existing PIR board or in the board after uh, people stepping down, et cetera. So this is, this is systematizing it in a way that I think moves it into something where there's a potential conflict if you are a candidate, because you're functionally writing your own job description. And that's that's the concern I'm raising for why this might or might not um, require um, either a recusal or simply not having those people serve on the committee. Um, and that's what I'm hoping the governance committee will give its perspective on as a, as a follow-up. Andrew. So the the... What we are currently doing 
both with the nomcom and in fact with the community is identifying a sort of general uh you know um set of of functions that we want within the within the board but we're not identifying currently to the nomcom or i think the nomcom knows it implicitly um but i don't think we're identifying to the community look these are the things that are either shifting or important considerations in making decisions this year. And that is a weakness in our current governance structure that would be an improvement if, if we you know, sort of identified to the community, okay, these are the, like, these are the skills that we're looking for to make sure we have either continue to have or you know, amend the, the board uh, in, the, in the coming year because these are some things that we would like to have uh, within the board. And I think that that is the, that is a sort of signal weakness of the current process that this is in intended to, to, to address. And so then the question is, um, and I think the question you're posing, and I think this is a question that the, the committee needs to work on. I don't think we need to resolve it right now, but the question is whether that is sort of presumptively um, putting the finger on the scales for somebody who either has or does not have those, um, those skills uh, if, they, if they join the governance committee. Um, I, I, I just will note that, you know, there's a difference between saying this is a skill that needs to appear within this collection of people and, you know, I am the person who has the skill and therefore, which is very much more like on the nom in the nominations committee where you've definitely got, you know, candidates that you're recommending rather than a set of skills. So I, I, I want us to be clear about that. But the, the, the central point here is, in fact, to inject into this discussion, uh, into the into the selection the ability to say, look, these are specific skills that actually are, are, are things that are currently necessary given the selections that are coming up. And I, I think that that is something that would actually be an improvement to our processes. Uh, so I think based on the straw poll earlier, there's nobody in the board who objected to having it somewhere in our processes. The question is how to get that done. Um, and I think the a slightly different way to, to rephrase what you just said is to the extent that this exists now, it's in the nominations committee interacting between uh, the advice they get and the specific candidates. Um, we're moving it back because the nominations committee is sort of a delegate of the governance committee to some degree. We're moving it back into the governance committee by this. And I think the, the board may need to, to figure out if by moving it back into the governance committee, we're moving that... Um, bar for conflict of interest into the governance committee or not. If, if we move it into the governance committee, we have to answer that, that question. If we, if we say instead, no, we want this to go into the nominations committee and we're going to delegate it to the nominations committee, maintaining this matrix, et cetera, then we have to deal with the fact that the nominations committee is a, currently a, a joint committee between board members and non-board members, and we'd have to work that through. Either one is possible. We just have to figure out where where we want to do it, and I think there's there's broad agreement in the in the board that we want to do it. It's just a question of how do we do it in a way that doesn't tie our hands in some other uh, uh, aspect of uh, committee uh, operations. So you, you've gotten a lot more um, conversation than I think. You expected yes, yes, to but but just a quick point. I I, I my first reaction is that it's probably better to keep it in the governance committee because of the fact that it's all trustees and if there's any potential conflict you know the, the trustee can be recused and so on rather than the nomcom because you would have a lot of people who might potentially be interested in joining the nomcom because of that potential conflict okay so but anyway we can take it back yeah, to the committee think, yeah. to further discuss it and uh, come up with a better wording and so on and come back to the That'd be great. Board, and if, yeah. if you just have it, uh, what it would speaking personally, not as chair, I think it would be very valuable if you would if you'd make a call within the governance committee about whether you think um, you need to exclude, ask people to recuse or there is no conflict because you're going to rewrite it in a way uh, to write the conflict out. Uh, that would be really useful. Thank you. I think that's that's the uh, report and the discussion on the on the on the on the on the uh, uh, chart on the yeah the, the charter <laughs> the charter review. I think I think that's the whole purpose. I think we got a lot of good react uh, uh, responses and and discussion from the trustees to go back to the committee to finish the work. Okay, and and given the the um, 
the discussion. I'm, I'm not going to bring the, the, the charter resolution to a vote. Uh, the next item of business is on uh, the, the comp committee. Uh, the compensation committee did most of its work in uh, July and sorry January and early February, uh, doing the annual performance review of the CEO. Um, this has been documented in, in approved minutes by the committee, but just to review it, uh, the committee awarded Andrew Sullivan a base performance score of 77.74, um, and we reviewed the uh, disqualified persons uh, reports from Willis Tower, Towers Watson. Uh, giving the total remuneration plans for the executives, and we agreed that they were uh, reasonable for, for say, Sally and Renalia, which were the ones that were brought to us. Um, and we awarded uh, corresponding variable performance uh, for Sally at 94, at say at 94, at Renalia at 91, and in Lona, who, although not a disqualified person, went through the same process at 94. Uh, so those were all uh, resolved and uh, uh, done in the in the in that time frame, and the um, sorry that was the February sixth meeting, and then the minutes were approved by e vote. Uh, are there any questions about those results? The other item of business for this is there is a a a proposed change to the uh, um, compensation committee charter. Uh, the red line of which you will also find in the uh, board effect. And the change is uh, to call out uh, the general managers um, who were not called out before. And yeah, they were called managing directors before. Uh, sorry. And they, they weren't there at all. Sorry. They, they were. Yeah. Sorry. They were not included before. Uh, so one of the things it says is annually obtain and review market data with respect to the compensation and benefits uh, provided by comparable or organizations for comparable services to those provided by the foundation's managing director and executive director and for uh, similarly the managing director uh, for the Internet Society. So basically this puts onto the plate of the, um, of the compensation committee uh, the, those reviews. Um, are there any questions about that change to the charter? Okay. Uh, there is a proposed resolution for this, which reads, whereas as part of its annual work plan, the compensation committee reviewed its charter and revised it uh, to reflect updated titles. Whereas the amended and restated bylaws of the Internet Society Article 2 section requires the Board of Trustees to approve committee charters, resolve the compensation committee charter as presented is approved. Is there any discussion? Uh, would those in favor signify by raising your hand? Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, that passes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think the next bit is the Finance Committee report. Laura? Hi. You'll actually find the Finance Committee report in the second part um, <clears throat> of the meeting because I put the closed and open parts really together. Uh, but I'll talk about the open part first, <clears throat> which is uh, the Finance Committee did several things this quarter. Uh, one of the things was to review the pre-audit financial results, which we'll talk about after Say has presented those. Um, the other thing that's sort of significant was that we recently received a briefing from Goldman Sachs about the mar market conditions and outlook. So I think that's worth mentioning um, because we had a very good discussion about the collapse of some notable banks recently, particularly Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Banks and what that means for the society. And there's not sort of a direct impact on the society's finances, which is good, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but there is follow-up work for staff, uh, you know, reviewing our banking to consider, you know, and not having all of our eggs in one basket and training staff on things like dealing with changing vendor bank details and avoiding fraud in those situations and so on. Um, <clears throat> so that was useful. I think it's um, it's worth us continuing to pay attention to that because it does affect market conditions. Secondary thing is uh, finance and legal teams have been working with the Connected Giving Foundation uh, to 
assist with managing ISOC's financial reserves. And that is actually particularly notable because it should positively affect the public support test uh, and help to keep us within the appropriate window. Uh, third thing, <clears throat> the finance team of uh, the society has been working pretty hard over the last few months to implement the reallocation strategy. Um, and the one thing I wanted to point out to you is that, you know, this set of uh, financial results pre-audit and when we see them finally, you know, at the AGM <clears throat> are going to look pretty different from what we see this time next year. Um, so just, you know, when you get this time next year, don't try and directly compare them because obviously we'll have moved a bunch of things around. Um, and sometimes people get upset about that because it breaks trend lines and so on, but this is for a, such a good reason that it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, it's something we just have to live with. So generally speaking, I know it's been a lot of work for Say and the team. So um, the committee officer, thanks to Say and the rest of the team for their excellent work on this to date. Uh, I will come back and talk about uh, committee's commentary on the pre-audit financial results in the second part of the meeting. So that's all, any questions, comments, discussion? Okay, I think they're probably waiting for the second yeah. half of the report to have a Maybe not. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, Luis, the audit committee report. Yes. As, um, as you know, the, um, the season for the audit is going to start as we, we, we uh, finance and management has submitted the results of the last year to the to be reviewed by the uh, external auditor, the first, imp uh, first impression of the uh, external auditing firm BDO is that the um, things are clean. Yes, uh, everything looks in order. We are expecting the first report by the end of April. So after that, we will have the results or, or the first results of audit. Yes, this is just a preliminary report. They sent us uh, something that is called the audit planning for the year ended on December the 31st of 2022. And here in this uh, calendar, they, they, they say us that the, um, the scope in this audit is going to include uh, fraud risk, internal control over financial reporting, taxes and related disclosures, review of information systems, investment and related disclosures, accurate and timely capture of expenses, evaluation of related party relationship and transactions. And this has brought our attention because they're putting emphasis on cybersecurity. And okay, we say we are the internet society, so there shouldn't be any problem with cybersecurity, but maybe we should think about it and, and review our uh, cybersecurity practices. From the audit point of view, cybersecurity is seen as a risk to the organization and their finance. Yes, so the, um, that's why I brought it to the attention of the, uh, the rest of the committee. Uh, just the calendar, as, as I was explaining, by the end of April, the field work is finished, and then we'll have the reports in May. And in May, there will be another uh, meeting with the audit committee and by September, we'll be ready to prepare our 990 form, which uh, finally will be presented in uh, October by the, uh, by the uh, audit committee. And that's the plan for the year. I'm very happy to answer any question or comment. Uh, no, I, I don't know that actually Laura and I ever mentioned this to the board. I know we told the senior staff there was actually an attempt um, to spearfish Laura uh, back in, in June of last year. Um, somebody pretending uh, to be me tried to get in touch with her to get her to pay uh, something for the ISAC Foundation. Yes. Um, uh, and we told um, Andrew and Kevin about it uh, so the senior staff were aware of it. 
and and obviously uh, <laughs> somebody pretending to be me trying to get Laura to pay something wasn't going to work very well anyway. Um, but uh, it was it, it it is definitely something uh, to be aware of that there there are phishing attempts and spear phishing attempts. Um, and I suspect that one was particularly timed because we just announced the, the new officers election mm -hmm. right after the AGM so that they may have assumed that uh, one or both of us was um, new. new to the role or mm -hmm. uh, n not well coordinated. Uh, so it is definitely something we need to pay attention to. Right, I think that brings us to the end of the open to observers section uh, for now, is that correct? Okay.